Elise here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to Tara Memoirs. This week we're talking about The Star. So this is a reprieve, hey? Like we just had The Tower, we've had The Devil, we've had Death. Yeah, there was some temperance in there, but the last few weeks, some tricky stuff. The Star is a good card. <laughs> It's actually one of my favorites in the whole deck. Um, if you are new to this series, what I like to do is I will share with you some excerpts that I've highlighted from my favorite tarot books. I will show you some different examples of the star from my own deck collection. And then we will dive into the way that I think that this energy shows up for me in my real life. So that's why I call it Tarot Memoirs. I usually like to share a couple of like little ways that this shows up, like in Light and in Shadow. And then at least one sort of memorable moment that I think was really a star moment. So with that said, let's dive right in. So I have, as usual, my three, my sort of big three tarot books. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start out, as usual, with 78 Degrees of Wisdom. I have been thinking I may change these books up a little bit when we get to the minors because there are a couple of books that might be fun to pull out for that, but we will cross that bridge when we get there. For now, good old Rachel Pollock for this one is where we're going to start. So as usual, I've highlighted some sections in the book that I think speak to, or at least stood out for me when I was studying. Um, so without further ado, let's see here. One of the first things that I highlighted here was just a simple phrase that said, after the storm, peace. <laughs> and that is totally what the energy of the star represents to me. It's like, okay, you've just been through a whole bunch of crap. Now you get a moment to just pause, take it in find your footing again, heal, right? So I really, I really love the comforting energy of this card. So moving on, she also says, it is worth comparing the star with temperance, where we also see a figure pouring water and holding two cups with one foot on land and one in water. Both cards come after a crisis, but where temperance is controlled, the star is free, not clothed, but naked, not standing stiffly, but supple and relaxed. And finally, where temperance pours the water back and forth, blending, but at the same time conserving, the star maiden pours it out freely, confident that life will continually supply her with new energy. The picture suggests all those mythical chalices that could never be emptied. Which I just, I really, really like the way that that was worded. Uh, let's see, there's a bunch of pages in this book on every card, but I'm just going to go over <laughs> a few more highlights here. So let's see, 1 plus 7 equals 8, and we can see that the star is strength raised to a higher level, with the Lion of Desire no longer simply tamed, but transformed into light and joy, which I think is a really cool perspective. The stars on the card are all eight-pointed, which is another reference to strength. So I thought that was also kind of cool. So, um, yeah, I hadn't really compared this to strength before, but numerologically it makes sense, and just seeing sort of that place of really having to work at finding that peace and that balance and then seeing it come to fruition in the star, it does make sense. Despite all the suggestions and manifestations, the star is not really a card of action, but of inner calm. So it's much more passive that way. Um, for the moment, the journey can wait. <laughs> so this is again a moment to pause, to reflect. It's not the waiting of the hanged man, that sort of anticipatory waiting. The star is more like a period of healing. Sorry, I'm interjecting my own thoughts in between the highlights. Going back to the highlights, in divinatory readings, the card expresses hope, a sense of healing and wholeness, um, especially after emotional storms. Reversed, we close ourselves off from the card's calm and hope, experiencing weakness, impotence, and fear. This deep insecurity can sometimes mask itself as arrogance. So I thought that was really interesting um, from Rachel Pollock. When I, it's worth noting that I do like to share the reversed um, highlights, but I see those as sort of the shadow side of the card more so than I than actual reversals, which I don't read. Where'd my bookmark go? I do this every time. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so good stuff there. Quick snapshot from Melissa Sanova in her Kitchen Table Tarot. Let me find my star card here. Where did we go, star? Ah, here we go. So Melissa has in each intro to the major arcana she has an action phrase so this one says i am hoping which is very apt so there's a, quite a bit i highlighted in here because i really liked melissa's take on the card from an upright or light position uh so let me hold this back up actually yeah let me hold this back up in case it matters here if you imagine the towers collapse, what happens after a building falls? There's rubble everywhere. If you know, if you know the landscape, if you knew the landscape, everything has changed and you're now disoriented. There are clouds of smoke and the air is heavy with ash. You are heavy too, with the repercussions of what just happened. 
You're not looking for the glaring light of the sun or the watery, wavery light of the moon. What you need is a light that will fill your soul and shine on you so gently. This light won't hurt your eyes. The star peeks out and starts to quietly and slowly illuminate you. Beautiful. That's what this card is. Hope, beauty, faith, restored. This card is like a healing balm on an old wound. Just when you think everything is lost and the dark and twisties have taken you as far as you can go, you see the twinkling of the beautiful stars and your heart lifts, if only just for a bit. Later on she says, even after a crisis has passed, we'll continue our reactionary and flinchy behavior, even though it's no longer needed. Almost like post-traumatic stress disorder, really. We have to retrain ourselves to relax and to stop anticipating trauma. It's very difficult to do, and one of the reasons I appreciate how soft this card is. It's not an everything is super as the sun card, but is more like a gentle hug and a pat on the back. Everything isn't super, but everything's going to be okay. And sometimes that's enough, yeah? So I really like how she expressed that in this book. And it's really, I think, why I always feel this like sense of, <sighs> whenever this card comes up, it's like, okay, we get a breather, we get a little moment here. So moving into Holistic Tarot by Benabelle. Oh good, I did use a bookmark. <laughs> Um, some things here that, that I've highlighted that she has said. Oh, I highlighted quite a bit on the star, probably because I love this card so much. I mean, who doesn't like the star? Really? I think it's a good card. Anyway, the star represents hope, inspiration, and mental health. Um, key 17, the star, is the good omen of contentment. Oh, it's that feeling, right? It's that like, oh, I can, I can relax. I can, I can have a sip of my tea. I can take my time. It is tea, even though the cup says coffee coffee was this morning twice anyway the star suggests renewal or restoration of hope so we're seeing a re reiteration of the same idea here compare the eight-pointed star on the charioteers crown in key seven the chariot recurs here in full bloom in key 17 the star there's a sense that the star was the source of the charioteers divine empowerment I thought that was a cool comparison, so I kind of expected the strength comparison because numerologically the star is 17, 1 plus 7 equals 8, numerologically this is also an 8, but here Benabel compares to key 7, the chariot, and talks about how the eight-pointed star is echoed as on the charioteer's crown, which I don't have the chariot card here handy, but I thought that was a really cool comparison. And one of the things I really like about Holistic Tarot's card definitions is she regularly makes these comparisons. Moving on, she also compares to Temperance. Key 14 Temperance also depicts a figure with one foot in the water and one foot on land. And it's funny because I've never compared Temperance and the star before. Um, the open sky and mountain peaks in the background, the green terrain between the peaks, and water pool in the foreground are similar in both the star and Temperance. Both call to mind the Freudian and Jungian concepts of superego, ego, id, the conscious, and the unconscious. Here in Key 17, the star, however, the superego is the dominant level of awareness. Unlike temperance, where the sun symbol, sorry, where the sun symbolizing the superego is smaller and in the back. Unlike temperance, where there's balancing between the levels of awareness, the star card depicts a pouring out in one direction. The star is about a release or giving of energies from the conscious to the unconscious, the superego to the ego. So definitely one thing that stands out from all three books, or at least from Rachel Pollack's book and Benabel Wen's book, is definitely this idea of in temperance we see control and moderation and conservation whereas in the star you see this light pouring out and I really like this idea of there's always enough that kind of clicked for me when I read these different excerpts it was like oh yeah the star is like there's always more there's always enough it's kind of like sometimes our tower moment might be a relationship falling apart well there's always more love in the future there's always there's always enough to go around. This is really useful when looking at things about abundance and prosperity and financial hardship. It's, it's yeah, you might have just lost everything. Maybe you just filed bankruptcy and that was your tower. And the star is here to go, but there's enough in the world to support you. You will find your footing again. And I think that's what I love so much about this card. I did that pretty good. We're like less than 10 minutes. I am like on a roll. Let's get into some card images. <laughs> I think it's easier because I'm not like stalling like I did last week with the tower. Oh my gosh. I was like, I don't want to do it. I want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to do it. But it was so good. It was so healthy. So we know the star here. Hopefully we have seen this before, but now you have. This is from the Rider Waite Centennial Edition deck. Um, this is my favorite version of the Rider Waite other than the Dirty Pam uh, as nicknamed by Kelly Bear. No. Yes. No. Yes. Kelly Bear. <laughs> Sorry, I had an argument with myself there. 
So um, she nicknamed the Dirty Pan the Dirty Pan because it has bolder, vivid colors. There's a version of that deck coming out this year by Los Scarabeo 2019, if you happen to be watching this at the time I'm filming it. Anyways, other than that deck, which I love the colors, I really enjoy the muted colors in this. The original um, Rider Waite decks that I was exposed to when I was first coming out into the tarot world were very bright, glaring colors, and it put me off a bit. But this Centennial Edition, love it. Anyways. I can't do this about every card or we're going to be here all damn day. Anyway, uh, another really beautiful, sorry, my hair keeps sticking in my lip gloss. What's with that? Anyways, it's worth it. It's worth it because it's so pretty. Anyway, I have here the Crystal Unicorn Tarot. Those are the backings. This deck is by Pamela Chen. And I'm so sorry, but I forget the artist and I don't have the box in front of me. Um, very much a Rider Waite Smith clone, like very much a Rider Waite Smith clone, which is what makes it so darn cute. Like, it's pretty much a mirror image for the most part, just with new coloring and with unicorns instead of people. It's so peaceful. I love it. Look. Okay. Sorry. I said I wasn't going to do this for every card, so I really can't. Okay. The Pole Star from the Wildwood Tarot. This one is illustrated by Will Worthington. That's what the backings look like. It is, mine's trimmed, so my backings look a little different. So do my friends, because I made it borderless. The Pole Star here, what's interesting about this image is that... The Pole Star uh, slash the North Star, I believe it's the same thing, um, but regardless, it's meant to be more of a navigational. It's that getting your footing again, finding your way again, and clearly this figure is finding their way through a dark path or a forest, um, and you really get that idea of navigation and of finding your way. And I think that's a big thing, because when the tower happens, like Melissa Sinova points out in her book, we're kind of we're lost, we're confused, we're disoriented, and this just kind of helps us find our way again. Love that image. The Star from the Mythic Tarot, and I don't have a lot to say. This is actually one of the decks that I'm going to be um, studying this year. I do know that this depicts the Pandora's Box myth, but I don't know enough about it, that myth, to comment just yet. Um, because I always saw Pandora's Box as, I think there's something in this story about this whole event bringing hope back into the world something's like kind of ringing a bell if you know this story and you want to enlighten us all down below because i haven't studied this deck yet um i there's something here about hope being restored as a result of this myth um i'm pretty sure so tell me tell me down below if you know the story i would love to have the that in the comments for other people when they find this video so please do share but yeah beautiful image this is the original mythic i'm going to be trimming this deck and i'm actually really excited to do it but i'm going to wait till i'm trim till i'm working with it. The star here from the Sun and Moon Tarot. This is the back. I believe the artist is Vanessa Delacorte or something like that for this deck. Love this image. I'm going to trim these two. Maybe I'll do that soon. Maybe I'll do that tonight. We'll see. I really want to see these trimmed. For a while I wanted to wait because I wanted to keep keywords, but I think I'm over that now. <laughs> I just want to see it trimmed. And I think Juliet Peekaboo Rose, um, that's her channel name, I think she trimmed her copy, and that's where I first saw it trimmed, and it's just so pretty. Okay, I'm doing the thing I said I wasn't going to do. Okay, I'm sorry. I really do love this card, though. So this is from the, um, oh my gosh. I know the name of this deck. I've had it forever. Do you ever have those moments where your brain just goes, why? why is it gone? Okay, we're going to circle back to this one while I get my brain back. Hold, hold please. Yeah, we're going to just... We're just gonna, we're gonna come back to that. I'm sure you know it. Like as soon, oh, Shadowscapes, there it is. Oh, phew, I knew if I stalled it would come back to me. Shadowscapes, okay, now I'm gonna show the image now that I don't feel like such a dummy <laughs> moment there. What I love about this is that she is actually stepping across the surface of the water and I believe, gosh, I wish these images were bigger. Um, no, that's a different image I'm thinking of, but yeah, she's stepping lightly across the surface of the water this is my big gripe. These images are stunning. I wish these cards were like twice the size practically. I know some people would be like, no, I wouldn't be able to shuffle it then. But these images just need more space. Anyways, this is beautiful. This is so beautiful. And I think she is both on the water and kind of underwater, weirdly, because there's fish around her. Um, so that's kind of cool. I believe the artist for that deck is Stephanie Poonmin Law. Memory. This is the Healing Light Tarot. Sorry about the glare. So it's all in um, silhouette, and then we see here the main star highlighted by the lemniscate where these um, circles sort of overlap. Really pretty. The star from the Mythic Fairy Tarot. 
Love this deck, Borderless. I'm so, so thrilled that I got to trade with somebody earlier this, or well, at the end of 2018, in the fall, I got to trade with somebody. I traded my Bordered version for her Borderless, and I just love, love this deck and how the colors pop in the Borderless version. So beautiful and peaceful and calming. I definitely noticed that in a lot of decks, there's a lot of blues, a lot of those peaceful, calming colors. This is the um, Journey of the Hidden Realm. Tar tarot of the Hidden Realm. I always get this wrong because the book is called Journey to the Hidden Realm. The tarot is called Tarot of the Hidden Realm. Look at the, how sweet this person who looks like he maybe has been through some tough times just seeing this little butterfly and going, oh, oh, it's going to be okay. You can kind of see that happening on his face. Love it. The star from the Deviant Moon. Even in this deck, there is something calming about it. At least to me. I know that's, I know this deck kind of gives people some weird vibes sometimes, but I really, I really think that this fits the theme of the deck really nicely and still gets the message across. <sighs> I haven't really looked at this one in quite a while. This is the Prisma Visions Tarot. This one feels very abstract to me. Oh, but I believe what we're seeing Maybe if you know more about this deck, tell me a little bit down below. But I think we're seeing almost the silhouette of a face here or a head. Maybe I'm imagining that. And there's all these little flowers. And there's something happening here in this shadow in the background. It looks like a person is falling. Oh, it looks like a person who was maybe previously falling from the tower. So I'm going to bring this really close so you can see her. Do you see this figure right here? She's like kind of in that free fall with the belly forward, heart forward. And it's like these plants have reached up from the earth and have grabbed hold of her and are gracefully bringing her down to the ground, like softening her fall, like protecting her somehow. That's a really interesting image. I haven't worked with this deck in a while and it needs to come up in my rota rotation again soon um, where I can work with it for a full week because I feel like I didn't give it quite a fair shot the first time. And there's a really neat um, layer to this image that I hadn't noticed before. Very pretty. The star from Tarot of Dreams by Chiro Marchetti, just gorgeous with these rainbows. And she's like almost like a part of the star herself. And she's just pouring these rainbows of hope down onto the earth. That's how I view this. Very, very pretty. I adore, like adore the star from the Spirit Keepers Tarot by Betta Bell Wen. It's called The Healer. And at the bottom it says Gifts of the Spirit this really encompasses the way that this card makes me feel and I love this image I love it yeah yeah just beautiful and the same sort of design on the the chest as we see in temperance as well it's kind of hard to see in this image I'm getting really close there it is the circle with the triangle and the square and finally, the star from the Marseille. This is a like inexpensive basic Marseille deck. I think it's a version of the Conver deck. So some of the coloring. This is not one of the. Um, this isn't like the Jodorowsky or the CBD Marseille where some of the coloring has been fixed a little bit. I think that's they've done that where sometimes things aren't shaded that should be. But like this plant here is yellow, like the like the sand, but it should be green <laughs> for a plant or something. You know that kind of stuff shows up in this deck. I don't think I've ever noticed this little bird perched on that flower right here, that little guy. I don't think I've ever noticed him before. Same idea though, we still have the two jugs, we still have one foot basically touching land over here and then the other foot in water, still pouring out right into that pool. Yeah. So those are our card images. Yes. Um, lots of different takes on the star, but all convey that sense of peace and of calm and of hope and again it's like that breath of fresh air so for me personally I'm just gonna look down at my notes but I think one of the things that I think of when I think of the star and how it shows up for me sort of in an everyday way in a in a light way um, is when you know you're feeling really emotionally wrung out maybe you've had a fight with a friend or a loved one or you've just been through the ringer like you just are feeling really uh, heavy maybe you're just you know hormonal and feeling a little bit out of sorts and then something happens like a friend calls you out of the blue or um, you know your partner makes you laugh or you know just something like that happens and you're shaken out of that emotional heaviness and you're sort of reminded that wait 
everything's okay. Like you're, you're feeling wrung out and you're feeling worn down, but then you have this moment and you're like, okay, everything's going to be all right. Like I just need to get out of this emotional heaviness because the stuff that has made you feel heavy like that has already happened. Uh, so I experience these moments, you know, many times throughout my life where like, I'll, I'll just be having like a rough crummy day and then I'll see something that'll make me laugh or I'll talk to somebody that'll make me feel better. And those are kind of the little star moments. They're those reminders that no matter how heavy you feel, there's always something positive to see around you. There's always something to be grateful for. And that's, that's I think, kind of how I see the star showing up for me in my day-to-day -day life in a positive way. In a not-so-positive way, um, it's kind of when I feel like I deliberately, almost like the Four of Cups, you know that image where, you know, there's this cup being offered and you're like, no, I'm too busy pouting over here. It's, that's kind of what it reminds me of, um, is... The star in shadow is when we're so busy feeling sorry for ourselves, or we're so busy feeling bad about the situation that we literally don't notice or see the positive that still surrounds us, the, the signs of hope, the signs that things are getting better. We, at least for me, like I keep saying we, but I feel like this is a common thing that people do. And so for me, the star shows up in shadow when I'm just kind of oblivious to the silver lining, when I'm not looking for it because I'm too busy wallowing. So that's kind of, I think, how I see it in a shadow way, at least in the day-to-day. -day. In a big way, the memory that I first came to mind when I was thinking about the star was my wedding to Peggy. So there was a thing around this because in order for us to get married and invite everybody that mattered to us, um, there was a process of making sure everybody knew that I was marrying a woman. So the way that sort of I decided to work my way around this because there was family that I figured out probably knew at this point, but I never did a formal com coming out except with my very immediate family. Everything else was just sort of letting word travel, you know what I mean? And so when Peggy and I got engaged and I wanted to invite the people that were important to me, I figured the easiest way to do that and let people have time to process so that they could work out whatever crap they needed to work out on their own um, was to provide save the dates. So even though our wedding was only like six to eight months from that time, it was around Christmas time, uh, we were getting married in August. So around Christmas time, I gave out save the date cards. So they were like postcards, save the date, you know, Peggy and Lisa. And we had a website where we told our story and our family and friends could go and like read how we met and like, you know, all that kind of stuff because we wanted people to, without involving us, or I wanted people without involving me to figure out how they felt and have time to sort it out before they got an official invitation. It just felt like the fair thing to do and also the safer thing to do in a way, like a safer emotionally. And when I first had those save the dates, I went to my uh, extended family Christmas party on one side of my family and I gave out some of those cards in person. And the reaction with them was kind of almost what I had hoped for or even mostly ex expected, which was pretty warm. Like they were pretty cool about it. Um, including my grandpa, who I still remember to this day, looked at the picture and was like, looked at Peggy and was like, is that Peggy Lynn? Because there was a picture of the two of us, which also I did so that people could see who we were, um, so that they could work on any issues around that. Um, but anyways, he looked at the picture and he's like, is that Peggy Lynn? Using her middle name, it was really cute. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, if she's the reason you look so happy, then I'm happy for you. And I was like, Grandpa was so cool and it just meant a lot to me and and my grandpa in a lot of ways was um, somebody that I idolized and he was a very special male influence in my life and it was just a really special moment but in the months leading up to the wedding as invitations and stuff started um, coming back RSVP started coming back it became pretty clear that almost nobody let me back up nobody from that side of the family was going to be able to make it. Now in some cases there was just vacations that were already planned. Um, I don't remember all the cir circumstances but I remember being at one point pretty devastated because my grandpa who was interested in going wasn't going to be able to make it. There was a clash with um, I think my aunt who was going to bring him and it wasn't going to work out so he wasn't going to be there and he was like the last one. The one that I was I guess really hoping was going to be there. And meanwhile another side of my family who was more religious, I would say, by far, at least in the ways that I interacted with them, uh, they all RSVP'd yes. And, you know, 
Actually, even not all, I don't even know if all of them are RSVP'd. I can't even remember, to be honest, because on the day, like, you get your RSVPs, and then some people show and some people don't, even on the day of. So, there's a lot of disappointments kind of leading up to the wedding, including a letter from my biological father, which basically started out with, I know you understand that we don't understand. And I was like, no. So that was pretty much the end of my relationship with him. And, um... So it was just kind of like there was all this like bad news in a way kind of hitting me lead in the days leading up to the wedding. And so when I showed up on my wedding day and saw this side of my family who I had not really got, gotten the chance to spend nearly as much time with as the other side, the one that I thought, the ones that I thought were going to show up in mass basically didn't, and the ones that I didn't expect anything from all were there. Like every last freaking one of them that was, that could be there was there. And that side of the family far outweighed the side that uh, was so cool about like it was it was such a weird lesson for me in not assuming how people are going to be in in not um I guess getting bogged down in expectations but all this to say how this star shows up for me is that I was feeling really bummed about like the people that I was so looking forward to showing up not being able to come and so when I showed up there and the people that I didn't think would be prioritizing this day were it just reminded me of what I did have. It was that moment of, oh, I do have all of this support and all of these people who love me and want to be here for me and, you know, want to wish Peggy and I well. And it just kind of lifted my spirits and gave me that, like, bit of hope, you know. And then things that I was worried about that day ended up going beautifully and people really stepped up to make sure that it went smoothly. And it just, it just was that reminder that even while I was, in a way, suddenly feeling distance from one part of my family or at least from my biological father that was a pretty big thing on my mind even while that was all happening I had all these other people stepping in to remind me that that's not all it's about and and it just yeah it was just that great moment after a very sort of almost towery mo stuff leading up to it to have that moment of hope and reminder of positivity and stuff so here are the journal prompts. So if you want to engage with this content, leave a comment down below. Talk about your star experiences if you are comfortable doing that. Or if you're not comfortable doing that in a public environment like YouTube, we can talk about it over in the Supportive Tarot Facebook group. I'm always interested to hear how other people have been experiencing this card. Um, also, you can... Um, what's the other thing? There's another way to engage. Oh, the journal prompts, the whole reason I had to come back on. So <laughs> the other thing I really invite you to do is to um, answer a couple journal prompts. I get all of these from Journaling the Tarot, a little book of big questions by Andy Matzner. And it's a book just of journal prompts. So I always pick a few for this series to share with you. So here's the few for the star. One, how are you finding serenity? Two, who or what gives you faith? Three, what, what can no one ever take away from you? Four, how are you a survivor? And five, who or what makes you smile? And with that, I hope you have a beautiful day, evening, wherever you might be. Remember to like this video if you enjoy this content. Subscribe so you don't miss future videos and click the bell if you want to get a notification when I put new content up. I do do new videos currently every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. Plus, I'm currently doing 31 Days of Tarot. So you're going to see a lot of me this month um, if you're watching this in January 2019 at the time I'm filming this. But with that said, I will talk to you all again very soon. Bye-bye.